The purpose of this book, Bartlett wrote, is to disabuse people of the idea that George W. Bush is a conservative president who has relentlessly pursued a conservative agenda. Those in the conservative movement know better. They know that he is not a conservative in any meaningful sense of the term philosophically. He is simply a partisan Republican." Close quote. What angered Bartlett was Bush's willingness to expand rather than contract great society programs and exhibit A is something I've already mentioned, the Medicare prescription benefit that the President ran through Congress in November 2003. LBJ could not have found a prouder sponsor. Bush's fiscal recklessness caused both the annual deficit and the national debt to balloon to all-time highs, as recently reported. On the day President Bush took office, the national debt stood at $5.7 trillion. The latest number from the Treasury Department shows the national debt now stands at more than $10 trillion, about a 75% increase on Mr. Bush's watch, the biggest increase under any president in U.S. history. Now let's look at the foreign policy conservatives and the divorce by what I would call the anti-imperialists. George W. Bush, let's just recognize this fact, has been the longest serving wartime president in U.S. history, and I mean by a long shot. You think of our wartime presidents, Abraham Lincoln, four years as a wartime president. You think of, you think of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, three years, four months as a wartime president. He leaves office still fighting two unresolved wars and having lowered American prestige around the world. That was bound to put strain on the conservative coalition. As the war in Iraq went south, a vociferous group of conservative critics emerged that included George Will, Brent Scowcroft, William F. Buckley, and Jeffrey Hart. These are various call, variously called realists and anti-imperialists, and these conservatives thoroughly reject Wilsonian idealism. In its place, they counsel prudence, moderation, and restraint. They sound a bit like the old Taft Republicans, or a, a little bit like Burke and his reflections on the revolution in France. And they sneer at the neocon Ken Edelman, who famously predicted, Iraq will be a cakewalk. One of the standard bearers of the anti-imperialists is Andrew Basovich, a self-described Catholic conservative. Basovich is a West Point graduate, a colonel in the army, a Princeton PhD, a professor of international relations at Boston University, and a grieving dad. He grieves because his 27-year-old son, his namesake, was killed by an improvised explosive device in Saladin province in Iraq. Basovich's books are hard-hitting critiques of the neoconservative foreign policy. The titles themselves are scathing and revealing. In 2002, he came out with American Empire, The Realities and Consequences of U.S. Diplomacy. In 2005, publication of The New American Militarism, How Americans Are Seduced by War. In 2007, there appeared The Long War, and earlier this year came The Limits of Power, The End of American Exceptionalism. Basovich notes the Boston Globe has been, quote, a persistent vocal critic of the U.S. occupation of Iraq, calling the conflict a catastrophic failure. In March 2007, Basovich described George W. Bush's endorsement of such preventive wars as, quote, immoral, illicit, and imprudent. This from a thoroughgoing military man, with credentials second to none as a military man. Underlying Basovich's analysis is that Americans are more voracious, hedonistic consumers of resources than ever. I won't go through the whole argument, but it's a, it's a fascinating study of how somebody who wanted to support Bush, initially supported him, fell away from the president. Let's look at the, the third and the final group here. Let's look at the uh, social conservatives, or what you could say the, uh, the divorce by the cultural conservatives. Among these uh, men and women are Christopher Buckley, P.J. O'Rourke, Pat Buchanan, Jeffrey Hart. Hart is particularly interesting. He taught English at Dartmouth for four decades, and during that same period, he was a regular contributor to National Review. He wrote speeches for Ronald Reagan. He characterizes himself as a Burke updated. He recently quipped, many Republicans must feel like the legendary man at the bar on the Titanic Watching the iceberg slide by outside a portal, he remarked, I asked for ice, but this is too much. Republicans voted for a Republican. 
and God George W. Bush, but his Republican Party is unrecognizable as the party we have known. Close quote, quote from Jeffrey Hart. At the core of his criticism is Bush's use of evangelical piety to disguise a radical agenda. Hart wrote, quote, the Bush presidency often is called conservative. This is a mistake. It is populist. It is radical. And its principal energies have roots in American history, and these roots are definitely not conservative. In a recent interview, the Dartmouth professor elaborated, like the Whig gentry who were the founders, I loathe populism, most especially in the form of populist religion, that is, the current pestiferous, Bible-banging evangelicals whom I regard as organized ignorance, a menace to public health, to science, to medicine, to serious Western religion, to intellect, and indeed to sanity. Evangelicalism, driven by emotion and not creedal, is thoroughly erratic and by its nature cannot be conservative. I wonder what he really thinks. <laughs> Cultural conservatives mockingly prayed that George W. Bush would be born again, but this time as a true conservative. Okay, let me try to wrap this thing up. It's one thing to divorce. It is another to drive someone to marry the rival. In our Republican form of government, one principal way we ratify a president's leadership is by electing his successor. So Truman ratified FDR, Johnson ratified Kennedy, George H.W. Bush ratified Reagan. And in 2008, not only did John McCain not ratify George W. Bush, not only did John McCain try to run against Bush, he didn't want to be considered Bush's successor, preferring instead to link himself to Ronald Reagan. The prominent conservatives who threw their support to Barack Obama include Bruce Bartlett, Andrew Bacevich, Jeffrey Hart, Doug Kamick, Andrew Sullivan, Ken Duberstein, Kathleen Parker, Anthony Sullivan, Christopher Buckley, and many others. With justification, some add to this list Bush's former Secretary of State Colin Powell and the reformed neocon Francis Fukuyama. The pedigree, influence, and intellectual firepower of the Obamacons suggests that Bush contributed mightily to deconstructing the edgy coalition that Buckley and Reagan had built up over the previous decades. But you know what? There's nothing new or shocking in this turn of events. The conservatives who repudiated Bush and voted for Obama in 2008 were actually doing a very American thing, and indeed, a very conservative thing. We forget that Russell Kirk backed Eugene McCarthy in 1968, not Nixon. And the National Review did not want to support Richard Nixon in 1960 and 1972. Then, as now, prominent conservatives were following a hallowed tradition going all the way back to the American Revolution to divorce for the sake of principle, rather than to suffer for the sake of politics. Thank you. <laughs>